Welcome to the Living Pianos podcast. This is Robert Estrin, and I am uh, here with my videographer, Mike Wood. Say hi, Mike. Hello. So this is the first in a series of podcasts. And just to give you a little idea of who we are and what we do, I'm actually a concert pianist second generation my father Morton Estrin was my teacher he also taught my sister Corin Mino and many many people from Billy Joel to conductors and all sorts of people so I've been around the piano my entire life and uh got a business called Living Pianos. We make videos, we sell restored top tier pianos all over the world. I get to meet some fabulously interesting people, which is why we are starting this podcast, because there's only so much we can do with our videos and we wanna take it to the next level. So Mike is a filmmaker and he's been an intrinsic part to this business for many years and you finally get a chance to meet Mike, the man behind the camera. And uh, each week we're gonna go through and kind of a recap of our videos that we produced that week. Cause we are producing videos every week now for, geez, how many years has it been? <laughs> Oh my I've gosh. lost count now. Over yeah. close to 680 videos now, I think. Oh my gosh, it's hard to believe. It's been a while. One at a time, so. <laughs> and then uh, we're not only gonna recap the videos, we're gonna have questions from viewers and listeners, because I get so many, I can't get through them all every day, and this is a way to, to really go in depth for people. I think you're gonna enjoy that. Also, industry news. Things happen all the time that I'm privy to, and anybody's interested in the piano, you're gonna to wanna to know about some of these cool things going on. And in the future, look forward to some interviews with some luminary musicians as well as industry heavyweights so you uh, get an inside view of what's going on in the piano world. So I wanna turn it over to Mike and uh, you know, tell people about yourself. <laughs> Nobody has really met you yet. Well, I'm always that guy that's been behind the camera for the past couple of years. Um, conveniently framed out of the picture. Uh, Bob's a real expert around here on pianos. Uh, I'm just here to provide some uh, hosting duties, I'd say, to bring up the topics, ask them a little bit more questions. Uh, for years, we filmed those videos. I'm the one who has to come up with all the questions for you. Now I'm just gonna have more questions for you. I guess so, I hope I have all the answers. <laughs> well, you see, what you don't realize when you're watching a lot of these videos and I'm just talking and it seems like I'm just thinking all this stuff up, what you don't know are the edited out parts where Mike's asking the questions, <laughs> prodding me along, uh, making me sound intelligent. That's, that's Mike's <laughs> job. <laughs> well, speaking of videos, let's get to our video from this week, which is on our YouTube channel. If you don't follow us on YouTube, it is youtube.com slash living pianos videos. You can also find them all on livingpianos.com. We have them on our blog page there. It's uh, on the top menu, pianos and music videos. It's real easy to just remember living pianos. It's alive. So uh, <laughs> now you're not going to forget it even if you want to. <laughs> uh, also, if you join our mailing list, we always release the new videos in the mailer as well as a classic video because we can call them classic now. We've been doing them so long. That's right. And you, we encourage all of you to subscribe so you don't miss anything. So the video this week, what if you don't get accepted at a music conservatory? Yeah, this sounds like a crazy question, but you can't imagine how many people I've encountered over the years who've had devastating experiences. Of course, there's some who have great experiences, and that's the crux of this whole issue, is that there's an element of randomness to any audition, whether it's to a school, a competition, a placement in an orchestra, what have you, and boy, dealing with that, it can be an emotional roller coaster. I'm gonna give you an example. I have a very talented student uh, who last year uh, applied to several schools. And one of the top schools gave him a full scholarship. Can you imagine? A full scholarship, one of the top music conservatories in the country. While another school didn't even allow him to audition. <laughs> I kid you not. So this is how extreme this can be. So one person might go to auditions and have the greatest experiences in the world and think, oh man, everything is a piece of cake. What's the problem here? While another person might not get into any schools at all. Now, is this a reflection of the talent, the dedication, the hard work? Sometimes it can be and sometimes it's not. So you have to learn how to like get through that. But you know what? This isn't just about 
college auditions, and it's not even just about music. This is a lesson of life, is that you can't take things too seriously if you don't land a job or uh, some other challenge. You know, you enter something into contest, you win some, you lose some, but ultimately, it's a numbers game. The more things you put yourself out on the line for, and the higher your tolerance for failure is, the more you can win, the more you can succeed ultimately, because if you don't try, you're not gonna get anywhere. And the biggest mistake that people make is taking these failures too seriously and letting it affect the direction of their lives. You can't let anybody else tell you what to do. You've gotta go with what is deep inside you. And if you follow those convictions, ultimately you're gonna be a lot happier than you know doing something that you think might be safe because what's safe in this life, you know? Ultimately, everything is chance. So you wanna do what you love and you'll have more energy and devotion to it. And no matter what anybody says, that's my opinion. Well, I have a similar experience. I went to film school, so as you know, it's also very, very difficult to get into any of the top film schools. I remember I only applied to two, which was probably bad in retrospect. I should have done more. Mm. Um, but I, tr I was applying for a transfer. One was to USC and one was to Chapman. I ended up going to Chapman. Um, I got very excited going over and submitting my application to USC. And as soon as I went there, they told me, uh, good luck will be accepting either one or zero students this semester. Oh my God. And it was just heartbreaking. I drove over an hour to get there and was just so excited oh. and had my spirits crushed. Uh, sent in my application to Chapman for transfer, got accepted. But on the day of orientation, when they were talking to us, they said, you should feel very lucky. There was about 15 of us in the room and they said, you 15 students are the only ones accepted out of 15,000. Are you kidding me? And it's just, it's oh. almost random because there's no way they can get through all 15,000 of those in depth. Well, just think about this. If there are 15,000 people just trying to apply to a school, how many people out there, you know, going for the same limited amount of work? Oh my God, particularly anything that's audition based. And uh, here's an example for you. My wife Florence is a fabulous flutist. She's played with many symphony orchestras. And of course, if you're an orchestral musician, Taking auditions is a fact of life. I mean, it's the only way that you get a job is if you take auditions. But because there are so many seasoned players coming out of conservatories all over the world every year, when they have an opening for second bassoon in some orchestra uh, in the middle of the country, in some, you know, not even a well-known orchestra, literally hundreds of people will apply for these positions. Here's where it gets really crazy. Sometimes they'll have an audition Hundreds of people will show up and audition. And by the way, it's at their own expense. They have to, the plane fare, hotel, months of practice. And I can't tell you how many times they don't choose anyone. And it seems hard to believe they, that- Nobody? Nobody. Yeah. So that, they have an audition and there's just nobody- Nobody's good started. enough for the oh, St. Wow. Louis Symphony or nobody's good enough for the Duluth Philharmonic, if such a thing exists. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put down any sympathies in general. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. But, you know, I have my own theories about that. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, because unions have gotten strong uh, or stronger, I should say, in some instances, it used to be a conductor was kind of a dictator and they could just choose who they wanted and put their orchestra together. And, you know, then the unions said this isn't right because some people never had a fair shot. So most auditions now happen behind a screen so they don't mm. even know who's there. So I'm thinking in these auditions where they hold an audition process, hundreds of people come and they don't choose anyone, maybe it's because there's someone they really wanted who didn't make it to the uh. finals where they get rid of the screen so they just don't take anybody until they finally get their guy or their woman in there. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much truth there is. Maybe some of you out there, if you have any experience with this from the inside, maybe you're gonna enlighten us, but it just seems kind of amazing that they can't find somebody good enough when hundreds of qualified people are, because even to audition, by the way, is not a foregone conclusion. You have to prove you are worthy of going there at your own expense to play for them. And at your own expense, yeah. That's right. There's a lot of expenses involved with it. You're not kidding. And it's a numbers game. I guess mm -hmm. the biggest thing is for younger listeners, especially, just don't get discouraged. A no doesn't mean it's a knock on you personally. It's more a numbers game than anything else. You gotta keep mm -hmm. going for it. 
Yeah, you know, it's easy to say that, but in the heat of the moment, it's almost impossible not to feel crushed. Why? Well, not only because it's, you know, they're judging you literally, but because think about what it takes to put together an audition list or a recital, you know, if you get a bad review for a performance. Months of your life where you're spending every waking moment with your instrument practicing and honing it in and playing for top professionals to get their viewpoint and doing mock auditions with your friends and recording yourself hours and hours over months and then in 10 minutes it's over like a flash and then if you don't even get called back it's like and then if nobody has chosen of course it's going to make you feel pretty damn bad (laughs) in that instance would you say even getting an audition should be viewed as a an accomplishment yeah you you know in certain uh areas just being able to learn the list for some orchestral editions not to mention international piano competitions anybody who gets anywhere in like the tchaikovsky competition or the the chopin cup any of the major competitions has to be a formidable uh, musician because the lists are so large. Usually it involves at least two complete recital programs, multiple concertos, chamber music, and you know what else they do? A lot of times in the international piano competitions, they have a piece written just for that competition that nobody knows, and at the competition they have just a certain amount of time to learn it. Oh, wow. I mean, so and I don't think that's very indicative of uh, a musician's uh, capabilities either. Not I mean, necessarily. I mean, <laughs> just because somebody can learn something fast doesn't mean they're better than somebody else. No. Well, the problem is trying to weed out players to hone in on who's the best. It's almost impossible. And indeed, it is impossible because it's subjective. You know, one person might prefer a different sensitivity and there have been instances where people have gone to competitions, lost, and there have been protests and one of the judges said they thought they should have won. And, you know, so a lot of times contest winners or audition winners are people who aren't necessarily the most dynamic personalities, but they're people who offend least. Mm. Because if nobody has a bad thing to say about somebody, they have a better chance sometimes, assuming they're accomplished, than somebody who comes in there and really plays radically different than somebody might just love it, somebody else might hate it. So to some extent, competitions and the audition process might in itself be causing a watering down of the range of expression that musicians uh, exhibit. This is just a theory, and once again, I welcome (laughs) perspective on this. So delving into a little bit off topic, but still on the same topic, what do you think of uh, people who end up switching their uh, instrument because there's more openings? I know, for example, a lot of violinists in high school and uh, early college who would switch to viola because they said there was more openings for that uh, around the country. Well, you know, I really believe that versatility is extremely important to be a musician. Uh, because we're living in a world where there really are just so many qualified musicians that if you can do more things, you are you are better off, uh, you know, more likely to find work. For example, people who, let's say, study classical piano in conservatory, and that's all they live, breathe, and do is, is solo piano even. Or maybe they do chamber music. Already that opens up vast possibilities if they just open themselves up to chamber music. But suppose they also play other keyboards. Maybe they could become an orchestral pianist. Maybe they learn how to play other idioms, pop music, jazz, blues. If you want to work in this world, the more things you can do, the more likely it is that you can work. However, the caveat to this is that you don't want to compromise so much that you end up doing something that you don't have a passion for because then it's just like drudgery. You might as well, you know, uh, get a real job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do something where you're you can just make a living because it's like a regular thing that people do. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think expanding your limits is great as long as it's not disingenuous. You don't want to play the viola going, oh man, I'm stuck with the viola. No, if you love the sound of the viola and you know you see more opportunities then great, go for it. All right, so let's move into some uh, listener and viewer questions. So this one, I'm pretty sad here. We actually don't have a name on it. So it must have been a comment left somewhere, probably on the YouTube channel. This is probably an oversight by me here. 
how do you know what tempo composers wanted for their music? Now, this is a really good question because rarely are metronome marks put in music, but occasionally they are. And I've got another interesting story for you. And this is actually one from, once again, my wife Florence was playing in an orchestra. I don't remember who the, the uh, composer was, but there was a work written for this group and she was playing in it. And indeed, the composer had put metronome markings in there. So she was working her buns off because it was very quick, very tough flute part. And she worked so hard to try to get it up to tempo and it seemed almost impossible. Well, finally came, this was at school and the composer himself came to the rehearsal. And then um, I guess they were conducting it. It was a much slower tempo. So she was wondering, you know, I thought this, did I get something wrong here? You're supposed to be this tempo. It's just, oh yeah, I just put that in. You know, they called me up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one facet. Even if there is an absolute marking, it might not really be that meaningful. But usually, what do you have in music? You have allegro, fast, or, or, or you have adagio, slow. Well, what's fast? What's slow? These are subjective, so once again. Yeah. There are many things that come into play with tempos. One thing I like to, to point out with people trying to be faithful to the composer's intention, which is laudable, and believe me, studying the score, I spend countless hours absorbing every last detail in the Urtext editions, knowing exactly what the composer wrote so I can memorize that and work from that framework. But do you think, for example, that when Chopin sat down to play his G minor ballade or one of his nocturnes, do you think that he played it the same way every time? I know that when I sit down and play a piece of Chopin, depending upon my mood, depending upon who I'm playing for and their reaction, the acoustics of the room, the sound of the piano, I may play a different tempo or a completely different interpretation. And I'm sure the composers, it wasn't set in stone. And this is the most important thing to realize about a musical composition. A musical composition is a skeleton. And the musician's job is to flesh it out into something living and breathing and real, much like a Shakespeare play doesn't come to life until it's performed. The play itself is not set in stone. It's open to interpretation. It's the same thing with a piece of music. So listening to a wide range of performances, which is so easy today, it's a, you know, you'll click up a button on your phone and you can get half a dozen performances of almost anything. So I think it's important to know the frame of reference of your listeners. And if you're playing a Beethoven sonata that's been played hundreds of times before, you should at least know what people expect it to be. Does that mean you have to mirror what everybody else is doing or try to find that median point? No, but if you're doing something radically different, you might wanna know that you're doing something radically different from everybody else. Like Glenn Gould in his interpretation of many Beethoven sonatas did radically different tempos on those works. And many of them are very exciting and interesting and different. And I think it's refreshing to have different viewpoints on pieces. You may love it, you may hate it, but hey, at least you have something to say. <laughs> it's interesting. I know that uh, with acting, for example, Christopher Walken tells everybody when he gets his scripts to take out all the punctuation. He doesn't want to know any commas or anything. It's all up to his own interpretation, which is, you know, he definitely has his own unique style with it. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be like uh, taking a musical composition, taking out all the phrasing or something. I mean, that's a part of the... <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> Well, I guess you'd say it's like what Glenn Gould does then. Yeah, I guess it's true, you know. Um, creative license. Some people feel more of a sense of it than others, <laughs> I guess. And, you know, I'm pretty pragmatic. Whatever works. Uh, the only thing that I take exception to is if something is boring. <laughs> that's the one thing I don't like, you know. And ultimately, the secret of music is engaging the listener by anticipating, getting them to anticipate where it's going by setting up, um, you know, expectations and then surprising in various ways. They could be subtle ways or dramatic ways. But if you don't have a foundation of something that is familiar, then it's impossible to, to be expressive because everything becomes random. So it's knowing what other people are accustomed to, I think, 
is a good thing. You know, just like language itself. If you didn't know language, how could you communicate? Well, music is a language also, and you want to know what the parameters are with, with pieces you're playing. But I think it's best to learn your piece first before influencing yourself with others and get the piece learned and on a performance level, then delve into listening to how everybody else plays it when you already have set your own convictions, not based upon uh, influences out there. So I have a piano question for you here. That's perfect, perfectly appropriate. <laughs> not about playing music, uh -huh. but about the piano itself this time. Uh, I'm a piano teacher in Melbourne, Australia, and I have just recently purchased a grand piano for my studio. I'm just wondering if you have any advice on placing rugs or caster cups under the piano. The piano may be repositioned from time to time for recitals, and we have hardwood floors. The room is roughly 4 by 10 meters, which is metric. So. Yes. Uh, with hardly any upholstery or furniture. Do you think it's necessary to get a rug? Is it difficult or damaging to the piano if we moved it on or off caster cups a couple times a year? Okay, well, there's a whole load of questions, <laughs> of questions there. Let's see if I can remember them all. <laughs> well, caster cups uh, can be good to protect your floor, although you'd be surprised at how well the wheels can distribute the weight, particularly some newer pianos that have wider wheels really are not gonna hurt your floor. The only caveat about caster cups, there are two problems with caster cups. One is it does raise the height of the piano a little bit, which sometimes could make it a little awkward. Now you might have an adjustable artist bench so you can sit the appropriate height, but the pedals are still gonna be a little bit higher and sometimes that can be a little bit uncomfortable. The other thing is if it's on caster cups, generally speaking, if you wanna move your piano, you have to take the caster cups out first, unless the caster cups have material on the underside, sometimes on a slippery floor, you could just slide the piano right on the caster cups, which could be very helpful. Now that gets to the point of the rug. It all has to do with acoustics. From the description of this particular room, it sounds like it's pretty live. It, it, there's no furniture, not a lot of drapes and things to absorb the sound. If you find that it's just unbearably loud and you and if you're playing full volume, it, it's painful or you're getting complaints from neighbors, a rug can really help to mitigate the volume because half the sound of a piano comes out the bottom. So a rug can, can actually be a real help in these situations. Now for recitals, you know, taking it on and off caster cups, it's not a huge deal. Uh, one or two people can lift up each leg one at a time while somebody else takes the caster cup out. You're gonna find, interestingly, that if you have small recitals in this room, when you bring all the people in there, your acoustics are going to be entirely different from when the room is empty. So if the room, for example, is beautifully balanced uh, with the rug, once you bring all the people in, it could be kind of dead because the clothing uh, absorbs sound and when you put a bunch of people in a room, the acoustics could be drastically different. So there's a lot to consider here and I think it comes down to a case by case, uh, you know, kind of setting, uh, the voicing of the piano. If you have, for example, a very bright piano in a room uh, on a hard floor with a strong player, uh, it could be a bit much. You know, your piano technician can also sometimes voice a piano down, softening the hammer by needling them or other techniques to get a mellower sound that might be more appropriate for smaller spaces if the piano is, are, is a larger, uh, louder instrument. I remember a real world example of this is when you performed and we have the video up there at the uh, Laguna Beach Art Museum. Mm -hmm. um, before you set up, it was in a room, very, very loud room. If you remember, wood floors, big mm -hmm. gallery, uh, ceilings weren't that high, but uh, just a square room. Right. And before anybody showed up, you were worried because the piano, you had a concert grand piano and there was <laughs> yes. extremely loud. <laughs> I remember that. And when all the people came in, all of a sudden the sound changed That's completely. right. I can't tell you how many times I prepared for a uh, recital and I go in there to try the piano in the hall and everything is great. And then 
the first note I play at the recital, it's like, what? <laughs> it's like coming in there and playing that afternoon didn't help at all. It's a completely different sound, completely different experience. And that's one of the challenges that not just pianists face, but all instrumentalists playing to the room and the acoustics change when the audience comes in. So there's a lot. Ultimately, you have to use your ears. With that in mind, do you think it's a good idea to maybe have things louder before people show up? Well, it, it will be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes if you think that the piano is going to be too loud, uh, bring the people in and you're going to be fine. The worst case scenario, though, is that you feel totally at home and everything's wonderful. Then the audience comes in and you feel like you have no power and mm -hmm. you feel like you're working too hard. So you have to sometimes, you know, adjust your perceptions and your uh, expectations of sound so you don't, uh, you know, get out of the zone and you start working too hard. And if you work too hard when you're playing an instrument, whatever the instrument, you'll usually get a harsh sound because when tension is introduced into your playing on almost any instrument, it causes an ugliness to the sound. So um, you're better off sacrificing volume in such an instance than to try to match the sound you heard earlier in that space. You just can't do it. You just have to go with the way it sounds and make it beautiful. So when you're performing, is let's say a loud room and a loud piano, is that worse for you or for the audience? Ah, well, that's a good question. It depends upon how loud it is, how big the room is. Uh, if you're on a stage, for example, it, it can be very deceptive because sometimes it can sound beautiful on the stage and out in the audience, it's dead. And sometimes it's just the opposite. You're on the stage, nothing is worse than being on a stage where you can't hear the other musicians you're playing with. And sometimes it's, it could be a nightmarish situation. And uh, there are no hard and fast rules, unfortunately. I wish I could just impart something that's you know, checklist A, B, and C, but it's much more complex than that. Well, I guess it's not so easy with classical music because in rock music, like when I played in rock bands, you'd have monitors on the stage. So exactly. So you'd be getting yourself back at you. So you would hear the other musicians and yourself, but you don't have that luxury, Right. When you have amplified music, it's a controlled situation. Of course, I don't know how, many, how much experience you have with this. It depends who your engineer is and... <laughs> you know. Oh, well, the monitors were never great. <laughs> it's never uh, you, good. You know, basically, uh, if if you've ever done any engineering, you'll know that everybody wants, I want more me. <laughs> everybody <laughs> wants more of themselves in a monitor mix, inevitably. So sometimes it's a challenge unless you have multiple monitor mixes, you know, in, in a you know ideal situation, which unfortunately rarely happens. That's got to be incredibly tough to deal with if you're on stage and you can't hear the other musicians, especially if you're you're playing piano with them, mm -hmm. like with an orchestra. Well, the way things are working now is, you know, in bigger shows, of course, they have two engineers, one front of house who's mixing for the room and another one who's right there next to the musicians doing the monitor mix. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the in-ear monitors enable... Uh, an engineer to actually listen in on exactly what each mix is with headphones to tailor the mix to each musician. And there are even some technologies where you can have a little iPad next to you or some other controller where you can control your own mix and you have all the different subgroups right there so you can get just the mix you like. And that's a beautiful situation. So in that case, you can just turn yourself all the way up. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so moving on. How good are hybrid pianos like the Yamaha Avant Grand? All right. Well, this is an interesting story. I first played the Avant Grand a few years ago when they came out. At the NAMM show, they introduced them. Uh, the New National Association of Music Merchants has uh, two shows every year, and the big show is in the winter right here in Orange County in Anaheim, 10 minutes away. And it's a phenomenal show because the entire music industry from around the world uh, transcends upon Anaheim and the piano manufacturers, you know, there are you know, hundreds of pianos. So it's a great, great way to um, you know, try out instruments. Well, at this show, I was very interested in trying the Avant Grand. Now, what is the Avant Grand? Interestingly, this technology was something I thought of many, many, many years ago and was actually shocked that it took this long for it to come out. Uh, if you go way back in 1980s, I owned Music House Recording Studio in Bloomington, Indiana for many years. 
And aside from the different rooms and uh, all of that, I also had a state-of-the-art keyboard system where I had a piano disc in the performance room and in the control room I had Kurzweil controllers and computers so I was able to actually play the piano from the control room so I could play on the keyboard and the piano would play in the other room so this was such an amazing situation that a piano keyboard now also could work the other way. You could play the piano to play the keyboard. So for example, I played concerts where I would play on a piano augmented with Kurzweil and other sound sources. So it got me to thinking, what if you had just the real grand piano action in a box and you put MIDI controller on it so it would sense all the keys and then you have a beautiful piano sample so you'd have the touch of a grand piano with the sound of a concert grand that never goes out of tune that you could play with headphones and all of that. Well, the avant grand goes one step further because it also has a speaker system that mirrors the sound of their concert grand uh, piano. So you get a real visceral experience playing this. You actually feel the vibration of the sound in the key bed. Well, my first experience with it was really hard to describe because I went to the show and there was the avant grand. I sit down, I played it probably for a good solid 20 minutes, you know, and it was by far the best digital replication of a piano I'd ever experienced. Um, was I completely blown away? Not yet. <laughs> Here's what happened. I walked over after spending 20, 25 minutes with an avant grand to the opposite side of the room where they had a brand new top of the line Yamaha concert grand. And I sat down and as soon as I played the concert grand, I felt like I was playing the avant grand. It was almost like the concert grand almost felt electronic. <laughs> not that the not that the avant grand seemed like a perfect acoustic piano. It almost seemed like the, the real piano <laughs> seemed electronic because it, it was so much exactly like the experience of playing that avant grand. So yes, they have replicated the sound and the touch of their concert grand in a hybrid instrument that has no strings. It has the real grand piano action that when you play it, it sets in motion the sound from the concert grand. Now, what is the value in this? Well, there's a lot of value in this technology and we're going to see this sort of thing growing uh, over the coming decades because there are some instances where a hybrid piano of this sort is far better, not just different, but better than a traditional piano. Take, for example, cruise ships or beach houses. These instruments, traditional pianos, absolutely cannot withstand these environments and they are horrendous. The weather takes its toll, the sound is awful, strings rust and break. Not only that, but even a piano that's in a, in a good environment, like in a practice room, getting played 20 hours a day, they're constantly drastically out of tune. The hammers get hard from impacting the strings over and over again, so you get a brittle, ugly tone. When strings inevitably break, the replaced strings uh, will not hold their tuning for, you know, for the next half dozen tunings, and at that point, more strings break. In other words, practice room pianos are a disaster, categorically. Uh, there are very few places that have good practice room pianos. It's a thankless task for the technicians who try to keep them in shape. So, personally, I'd much rather have an avant-grande to practice on than a typical practice room piano. Also, you can play them at any volume. You can record your performances and play them back perfectly. So there's great aspects to these instruments. Are they as expressive as a real piano? Well, it depends. It depends upon the piano. If you're, you're fortunate enough, as I am, to have an absolutely exquisite nine-foot concert grand kept in absolutely top-notch condition, all the time, then no, <laughs> they're not as good. But they're damn close when you consider what they are, they're pretty remarkable. 
But the other thing, of course, is you know, I'm hoping that Yamaha comes up with a, a Busendorfer version of their Avant Grand because maybe they already have. I'm not up on everything that Yamaha's doing lately because they own Busendorfer and they could indeed sample that piano and play that from an Avant Grand. In particular, if anybody from Yamaha is listening, I just absolutely love the new Model 280, not the Imperial Concert Grand, which are fine and great, but the 280, one of the nicest pianos I've played is the Busendorfer Model 280. So still on piano news. Okay, what are we going to do next? From the Frankfurt Music Messe. Is that how it's pronounced? Mm -hmm. You brought to my attention this very interesting new instrument that somebody made here called the Carbiano by Phoenix Piano. (laughs) Yes. Is a completely carbon fiber piano. As a matter of fact, uh, Tom from uh, Mason and Hamlin, I just happened to notice one of his posts on Facebook about this and it's like, oh my goodness, what is this? And I know that Mason and Hamlin has their their top-notch carbon fiber and other composite material action, the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross action. So I asked, is it utilizing the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross action? Sure enough, it is. But it goes way further because the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross action is everything from the moment you touch the key to the hammer strikes the string. And all of that is new materials that are uh, impervious to the elements and won't wear out the way regular actions do because Instead of traditional felt bushings, they use space age materials that will last much longer and uh, will not be subjected to environment. But this new piano, actually the entire soundboard and even the plate are made out of carbon fiber. You have written down here the pin block, the plate, the bridges, and the soundboard are all carbon Can you believe this? So you have a piano that you could put in you know, Hawaii, you know, with 90% humidity, it it will not be affected by the elements. And you have in here, the soundboard is embedded into the plate, not the wooden rim as in traditional pianos. So you've got nothing that's gonna be affected by the environment, which is astounding. Because, uh, you know, people who live in, in the desert or the beach, or anybody's in a temperate climate, unless you use the air conditioning all summer long, uh, and you have a humidification system to mitigate the dry heat in the winter, your piano is going to you know really take its toll season after season. Where this instrument doesn't have any of those problems. Now, of course, I wanna hear it. <laughs> I mean, I've played Mason and Hamlin's, and we also sell Weber pianos that have Wessel, Nickel, and Gross composite actions, and they're fabulous actions. So as far as the mechanical part of a piano, they got it down, they really do. But the sound producing, I know that there are some great violins and cellos and other stringed instruments made out of carbon fiber, as well as bows that many people find are top notch. And the same thing uh, can, can be happening with pianos. I have to play it before I can really judge it, but I'm very excited by this prospect. I'm really hoping it's at the next NAMM show. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we'll get, we maybe go get a video of you playing that. Yeah, there, we, we must. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting how things have changed, though. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, there's that reputation for plastic parts um, or Teflon, for example, right? Um, back on older pianos. And now we've moved into an era where the carbon fiber is replacing the wooden actions and it, it doesn't seem to have any of the, the issues the earlier technology used to have. Well, you know, uh, materials have come a long way. Uh, some of the very first pianos that utilized plastic parts in the way back in the 50s and 60s, uh, after a couple of decades, they'd, they'd get dry and they'd crack and you'd have to replace them all. Plastics have changed over the decades. They sure okay. have. Now you take, uh, the, the for example, the shanks uh, of the... Uh, where the hammers are attached on a piano. On the carbon fiber shanks of a Wessel, Nickel, and Gross action, every single one can be absolutely 100% consistent. Now you take the finest actions in the world, whether it's Renner or uh, Steinway or any of them, and you know, you can use the best woods, but no two shanks are gonna be exactly the same in regards to weight, strength. So as a result, it requires much more work on a technician, uh, of a skilled technician, to try to get adjacent notes to sound the same as each other when you have inherent differences in these shanks. Um, So when you have a precision 
with the shank, that's just one aspect of getting closer to the ideal perfection of voicing as well as regulation on a piano action. Now take it one step further, if you ever go play brand new pianos of the same exact model and make, you notice that no two are alike. Play three Steinway M's in your local Steinway store. You may love one, you may hate another one. Or you may prefer one for chamber music and another for something else. But they're all going to be different. Some are going to be gems and some are just going to be okay. And that's just the way it is. Well, when you're talking about man-made materials, you could actually strive for perfect uh, perfection. I mean, it's possible to get much, much closer to perfection. I mean, not working with organic materials so much. So I, I see this as a very exciting development. And just like people still play harpsichords today and people like to play uh, vinyl LPs, I don't think this is going to ever replace the piano. Uh, but there are definitely instances where these technologies can be a better fit for people, just like even digital pianos today can be a better choice for some musicians living in apartments with cramped space, without sound isolation, wanting to record, uh, and music software programs. Uh, there's, there's a host of benefits that technologies offer, not as a replacement, but as an adjunct to uh, traditional instruments. So you think with the production of these type of materials, eventually you could get a consistent sound on pianos? I, I think that consistency is one of the uh, great hopes that yeah. the question is, can you get as good a sound or potentially even better by using these materials? That is the question that uh, I'm yearning to find out. <laughs> yeah, I remember you telling me stories of when your dad would go pick out a Baldwin mm -hmm. and you would go with him and he would try what you say, just a room full of concert grand Baldwins. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he wouldn't like any of them. Sometimes he'd, he'd Oh, no, no, he'd always like them all. This is, usually they'd have a room with maybe half a dozen, and maybe there are three that they prep for him. So, because, you know, you can go crazy. You try six pianos. Yeah. It's kind of like, have you ever done a wine tasting with more than three three glasses? You'll be overwhelmed, yeah. <laughs> You'll also be on Everything the floor. Everything starts to taste the same after a while. <laughs> yeah, it, with pianos, it's almost impossible. You've got three instruments that are all top notch and prepped to the hilt. Well, my father, the way he would choose a piano, you know, it's the way I like to choose a piano also. There were two things that he went for. Number one, because he had a tremendous range of, of volume, uh, he would look for a piano that he could play loud and still have a warm sound, that it wouldn't get too crunchy too soon because with the enormous power that he brought to the table, he wanted to be able to get an instrument that could open up without getting brittle. But the other thing, he would all sit down and play the D-flat major uh, nocturne of Chopin because it has a very slow, high melody, and he'd want to hear the piano that has the longest tone life, the trademark of a great piano. Because you can get a singing tone where one note just melds into the next to get the illusion of the human voice out of a piano instead of the more percussive sound uh, out of lesser instruments. So he would usually tell me that, you know, any one of these pianos would be fine, but this one, just a little bit mm. nicer and voiced a little bit down, and that's what he'd go for. Yeah, I wonder if there is such a thing as like imperfection or perfection in imperfections. Because when you think about, like you said, records, for example, people still like to listen to vinyl. And I think the biggest knock on CDs and digital music is that it has an almost cold feel to it because the record has more warmer feel, the pops. It is a warmer sound though, other than the digital transfer. And I'm wondering if that's something that's attractive to some people. Well, you know, there are ways of making records sound good. There are also ways of making CDs sound good. Um, what's really odd is we're living in a, in a world where most people listen to 10% of the audio that's available because most people are listening on MP3 devices uh, or other types of compressed audio formats on mobile phones and, and players or YouTube. So even CD quality, which isn't the best, but it's a standard, has 10 times more of the sonic information than you're gonna get on a YouTube or, or yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> 
an I, a iPod or something of that nature. So here we are living in the in the 21st century, and we have sound that is not even close to the level of quality that we should be having. So people going back to LPs makes a lot of sense because they've grown up with this brittle quality of MP3 files, and LPs are arguably better. Now, having said that, I grew up with records, and I can tell you that <laughs> records can really suck in certain <laughs> regards, because particularly for classical music that's dynamic, records can't handle the full dynamic range of like, for example, a symphony orchestra or even a piano. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of records are compressed. As a matter of fact, all of them have what's called the RIAA curve, which is a compression scheme to try to get the, closer to the dynamic range of real music. Um, so you can make records sound good, but there are a lot of compromises, not to mention the surface noise. You know, in the olden days, I owned a recording studio for many years, and there was always the idea of signal to noise ratio. This was the most important figure because if you recorded on tape, there was always tape hiss. So if you record really loud on the tape, the tape hiss, you could play back your recording at a lower level so you wouldn't hear the tape hiss as loud, but then you have the danger of clipping, distortion on the peaks of the audio. So you'd ride that line trying to get as much saturation of the tape as you could without distortion to overcome the inherent hiss. Well, records have the same thing with surface noise and all of that. Digital, of course, doesn't have those uh, those elements to worry about. You mentioned the 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 uh, harshness. Well, there's a reason for that, because CDs are sampled at 44,100 samples per second, almost like like taking a film has you know may have 25 or 30 frames per second, and you see it as a fluid image. Well, your ears are fooled by slicing audio into 44,100 times a second. You think, oh my God, that should certainly be enough. Well. If you know a little bit about the nature of audio, you realize it really is barely enough because the top of hearing for most people is somewhere between around 16 to 18,000 cycles per second. And as you get older, it's even lower than that. But to get an accurate representation of a waveform that's let's say 18,000 times a second, the rule of thumb is you have to sample at least a little more than twice that otherwise you, you basically just have dots and then you connect the dots. Now, if you know a little bit more about audio, I know I'm getting pretty technical here, but it's pretty interesting, is that anytime you have a sharp line in a waveform, those are upper harmonics, which cause a metallic sound. That's why early CDs really sounded harsh and ugly. They learned how to use smoothing algorithms and filters uh, in order to get kind of a warmer sound, but in doing so, they're actually artificially affecting the treble. And the treble is where all the sonic information of the tone is. Overtones are what color your sound, and without them, you have a dull, lifeless sound. So what you really need is audio that's, that's sampled, not at 44, but maybe at 96, uh, which is another standard, and at more bits of resolution. Then you could get clearly better than any analog recording could be, whether it's tape or LPs. But sadly, the manufacturing has gone the other direction. We're having less audio samples to work with. So hopefully that'll change. It's interesting. I have an anecdote about that, I guess, is um, you, br you brought up film, for example. When Hateful Eight just came out a few months ago, Quentin Tarantino did that uh, short release of 70 millimeter. So mm. he's having it actually shown on film. All right. And did you hear what happened at the premiere at all? What? No. So for a screening for critics, they had the 70 millimeter and they started the first half and the projectionist had messed up. <gasps> Oh, so the no. picture was terrible. The audio was off sync. Oh. Everything was wrong. So by the time the intermission hit, it was so bad, they had to switch it to digital. Oh my And now God. here's the thing. It was supposed to be, we've gotten away from film and it's a better medium. Mm -hmm. But in that screening, they basically proved it's an imperfect medium because it didn't work. When they screened that second half of the movie, all the critics were commenting how great it looked. 
how much better it was. Mm -hmm. And then I know from reading comments that when people actually saw the 70 millimeter, they were like, oh, it's dirty. There's, there's imperfections on the screen. Mm. And it's like, well, this is, this is what movies were when I was a kid. Right. You wouldn't go pay extra money to go see a film. That's just how it was. But uh, since they've upgraded to digital, mm -hmm. there was a big pushback initially against that. But I think now I, I don't know any theaters you go to that don't right. show films digitally. Well, it's just kind of like uh, I mentioned my recording studio and I started with analog tape and that was what what the standard was because digital was ungodly expensive then digital became affordable and i migrated to a, a 24 track digital studio which was far better because the digital technology that was available uh, per dollar had gotten to the point where it blew away what you could get with analog so it, it came down to a numbers game but there were still professional studios up until just a few years ago, and I'm sure there's still a few left, still doing two inch, 16 track or eight track tape to get that analog sound. Mm. Because here's what you have to realize, I talked a little bit earlier, and I don't want to make this all about <laughs> recording, because this is a, you know, after all the living pianos podcast. But, you know, if, if you know anything uh, about, uh, about sound, uh, when you're recording on tape, if you record, hotter and you do it just below the point of distortion you know it lessens the dynamic range because it can't fit all that you can't, can't get the full range so it it gives a natural compression which is actually a very attractive sound so if you have a really good tape machine with good especially tube electronics it imparts a warmth that ultimately becomes part of the engineer's artistic expression how hard you hit the tape is gonna so maybe on a on a snare track you might really hit it hard to get that that grungy sound out of a snare so you're actually using the tape as, a, as an effect with digital now we have replications you know uh, on some of the audio software I use there are plugins that replicate tape you can actually say well, how thick the tape is how fast it's going I mean it's amazing <laughs> So this is the way uh, most people do it, but there's still purists out there who like to record onto analog tape for that sound. I can tell you from my perspective, mm -hmm. I would much rather shoot on digital, uh, digital rather than film. Yeah, yeah, shooting on film, I would never, never want to do that. Well, the again. whole process is completely different on film. First of all, you're limited to what ten or twelve minutes before you have to like pack it up and reload. And oh yeah, and good luck reloading that film canister if you don't have somebody doing it correctly. You could expose the entire mm. film, and everything you're going to shoot that day is wrong. Right. Or even when you bring it out, I mean, it's, right. it's very, very tricky. Have you ever heard the term "check the gate"? No, that's a film term that you use on set. So after every shot. So we go and check the gate to make sure that the film is oh, uh, like the not shutter being is opening? exposed. Yes. Oh my God! <laughs> well, the other thing, the whole process of filmmaking now is such that you have instant feedback. You know exactly what you, if you got the great shot or not. You know it. Yes, I like being able to just oh. replay it immediately. And digital audio, my God! I, I used to do razor blade editing, and I'd have reels all over the room, and oh. And it was kind of fun at the time, but now I think about <laughs> You wouldn't about, want to go back to it, I'm sure. Well, yeah, well, the, the beauty now is it's non-destructive. You can edit, you know, have five different versions of the same thing. Try that with tape. You want to redo an edit and you're undoing a splice? Oh, uh, wow. oh my gosh. Now we just have Control Z, you know. Just yeah, right. <laughs> so we've covered a lot of ground today. Yes. Um, still have a lot of questions to get to in the next podcast. Uh, we'll cover next week's video, which I don't have in front of me here, but uh, it'll be a surprise. Oh my gosh, I podcast. wonder what it is. Have we shot it yet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you want to find out more about us, livingpianos.com. Absolutely, and you can address your questions to robert at livingpianos.com. And uh, we make videos on some of them and feature the answers to the questions right here in the podcast. And it's been real pleasure and uh, we look forward to more of these, huh? Yeah, and speaking of the podcast, you can find us on iTunes as well as Stitcher, uh, anywhere else that podcasts are available. And if you could subscribe on iTunes, that would be great. I guess the Google Play Store just opened up for podcasts right. as well, so we'll be there. Um, and if you wouldn't mind uh, rating and reviewing us, that would help us out a lot. We'd as long really as you like it. us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, keep those one-star reviews away as well. All right. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.